Morning. Morning. Good morning, Bunty. How are things in London? Things are tip top, Rohit. How are things with you in San Francisco? Excellent. Very good. Uh, let's jump right into the episode. What story are we talking about today? Today, you know, one of the things that, you know, we exchanged some notes over last week was this whole thing around red lights, not as in red light district, red lights on cars in India being put uh, at an end to. So there's right. no going to, there's going to be no lal bhatti. So that's one thing that we want to talk to people about. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe that, you know, the story that you sent me, uh, let me mention the, uh, you know, exact story and provide those details just as a kind of reference. It's a story from the Telegraph Calcutta, uh, dated Thursday, April 20th, 2017. Uh, the story is titled, Mr. Swagger Learn to Live Without the Light. Uh, it's by a gentleman called Our Special Correspondent. Um, I don't know that. I just wonder if the journalist was, you know, afraid this would like piss off some politician. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually what happens is you use our special correspondent or the entire, you know, Hindu team or Times of India team when you're reporting on, you know, Dawood Ibrahim or Amit Shah or, you know, someone threatening like that. Uh, but this is a relatively mild story. Anyway, the long and short is that, uh, you know, uh, while the union government is, uh, the Modi government is presenting this uh, as a kind of gesture, uh, uh, you know, a populist democratic gesture uh, representing the fact that they don't want to distinguish between ordinary citizens and VIPs, they don't want to inconvenience ordinary citizens, uh, the reality is actually a little more humdrum and it lies in the competitive nature of Indian politics. Uh, apparently, Captain Amarinder Singh of Punjab, the Congress, uh, passed a uh, uh, a similar kind of rule for Punjab and then uh, I think the Aam Aadmi Party is also claiming credit for it and Arun Jaitley is now saying that you know there's we, we, we're going for May 1 we're not going to allow any red beacons I it, you know I think the, the public life in India comes with a few entitlements one of them is a white ambassador car it used to be now it's probably much better uh, different types of cars and then there was this red light Right. right. The second thing was um, when you and this trickles down right from politicians onto senior civil servants or carders of se civil servants who think themselves to be senior. Right. Right. So right. If you imagine yourself as senior, you need a car with a red light. The other markers of kind of uh, public life and entitlement is obviously bungalow living. That is one thing that signifies that you've made it in public life uh, in bungalow living in a city. Hmm. And then also having an office where your chair is covered with a towel. This is something that... <laughs> so if you go to... You know, at one point in life, I accompanied my wife who was doing some field work with senior railway people. And um, every time we went into the office, uh, you could tell the seniority of the guy by the quality of towel that was covering his seat. I, mm -hmm. I'm sure that has changed. And now there are different things, uh, different status markers. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking by removing one obvious status marker, which is a light on top of the car for politicians or bureaucrats, mm -hmm. what will be the alternative status mm -hmm. symbols? Because there will always be a status marker, right? Mm -hmm. Just by saying you're working in an open plan office doesn't mean everybody's boss, right? Right, right. The boss remains the boss. The papu remains the papu. It's just that they can see each other across right. the floor. There's not an office. No, I'm thinking... So in new modern day, in more contemporary workplaces across the world, status has taken on other signifiers in terms of, you know, the kind of mobile phone that you are given by the company. So you're sitting in an open plan office. The guy who joins is given a particular type of kit and the guy who's boss is given another type of kit. The way you fly across the planet. Right. So I'm thinking, so all I'm trying to say is that status there's a need for it. There's a place for it. Taking away red lights is a very kind of gesture politics thing to do. Right. I'm sure there'll be other uh, status markers, which will be even more costly. Uh, that is my hunch. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a brilliant insight that, uh, you know, the way to signify social status. Uh, I mean, human beings are always going to find a way. And from the time of, you know, Queen Victoria's Darbar in India, yeah. we have been an enormously status conscious society. And I think that was the sort of great... Uh, great insight uh, that the British had, right? That you give these Indians fancy titles, you call them Rai Bahadur and this, that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Lord Commander, British Empire, King's Council, whatever. Uh, and, you know, they will gladly sign away like, you know, 35% of their territory to you. Uh, 
so I, I remember some years ago I was in Washington DC, which has like lots of wonderful museums. And um, I went to, I think the Smithsonian and they had in, it was a Smithsonian Natural Science Museum. Uh, and in the gem section, uh, which mostly deals with, you know, geology and so on, uh, they had a special exhibit on jewels from the White House. Uh, many of which were actually gifts from very famous jewelers like Harry Winston. And they were these absolutely exquisite, you know, emerald, uh, sapphire, ruby necklaces. And they were all from the Maharaja of Kuch Bihar to Mr. and Mr. <laughs> Harry Winston. And, you know, I remember telling my wife then that, you know, you just have the feeling that this Harry Winston guy, this jeweler, he and his wife must have turned up in India at some palace. Some foolish Maharaja must have called them as a guest. The guy must have given the Maharaja some, you know, radio or telescope or whatever. And in return, the guy must have given them, you know, 20 kilos worth of like fabulous jewelry. Um, so, you know, we've had this obsession with having these things, whether it's a radio or it's a television set or the first color television. So it will be there will be some, you know, weird object uh, that's going to be a kind of fetish object to signify official status. And I think just extending on that point, Rohit, one of the things that I think might replace the lalbatti on the car is you know how how close the if you're talking about politicians how close the politician is to grassroots right mm -hmm. so you will see there sometimes there's this jockeying between people as to how authentic they are mm. right and the thing is, what gets lost in this authenticity debate is they were probably authentic at one. It's like Jyoti Basu and uh, communism. Mm -hmm. You know, he was one of the most entitled people uh, through in, in the India of the 70s and 80s. And right. he, he, he repeatedly had... led a communist coalition right. into power by uh, hanging around in the most luscious of environments. And I, uh, that kind of... Double take is something amazing. But let's find out what once the car with the lalbatti slips off, we'll have to figure out. And maybe our listeners can suggest some ideas of, you know, what could be the new status markers. I wonder if uh, it'll be... You know, there was an exhibition with these cows uh, in London some years ago. Right. And, you know, given that the cow Yes, yes, yes. Public art. Public, public art. art yes, right? yes. I just wonder, given the, you know, veneration this government has for cows... Instead yes. of a beacon, are we going to have these cows, not jersey cows, but are we going to have cows on top of cars? No, no. I think, Rohit, you're, you've hit upon a very good marker here. Cattle ownership is something mm. that is looked upon very favorably in uh, farm sta farming states like, uh, you know, where there's this kind of, like Haryana, where the right. Chaudhary Devilal, you know, is basically cattle ownership and politics. Mm. Uh, reminds me of that. So I'm thinking maybe political office and cattle ownership uh, or or uh, the the fetishizing uh, fet uh, you know uh, peculiar fetishism growing around livestock hmm. could be the next status. So you don't have a red light, but you have three hundred cows. You're absolutely and, right, and you know, like <clears throat> India's elite, including people like William Dalrymple. William Dalrymple yeah. calls himself a goat farmer. They yeah. all have these farmhouses in Chhatarpur, uh, yeah. you know, which have helipads and so on. And I do remember reading that. Some of them have, you know, special Jersey cows imported from the U.S. Uh, so that they can feed their, you know, 28-year-old sons fresh milk and so on. Uh, but I also want to mention, you know, one other thing. Uh, it's a little tangential. I do remember reading that cows and cattle serve a lot of very important purposes. And in Lalu's Bihar, there used to be cattle fairs, which also had cabres. Cabres in the Indian sense, not cabres in the Western sense, you know. In the North Indian Delhi sense, a cabre is basically a striptease. So right. there would be rural striptease cabaret dancing around cattle right. fairs. And and I think it's a phenomenon that has been severely ignored and understudied. Uh, but I think one of the things we should make it a priority to do sometime, Rohit, is we should go to a legitimate cattle fair. Now, we're, this is not to do with uh, cows. Or, yeah. But I want to go to a cattle fair where you can buy camels, elephants, because I'm told that there are large fairs like this, right? Uh, which have become like a really hotspot tourist destination. So right. maybe status will now in public office mean not only cows, but camels and elephants. So right. it will be an interesting time. Right. And you know, India always has this obsession with porn. So I think that if you really are the top of the heap, you probably will own a small llama. Uh, so <laughs> I think, <laughs> okay, you know, we're almost at time. Uh, uh, just before we wrap up this story, I just 
Uh, you mentioned Devi Lal. I want to just put something on the table, which we can go back to later. Devi Lal being made deputy PM was one of the great political moves in Indian uh, political history, right? And I still remember Devi Lal's face when he was made deputy PM. It was a face that could turn milk sour. So, you know, this is a story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Devi, Devi Lal, uh, at that time, I think English media or English speaking media was just on the rise. Right. And Devi Lal was this kind of fantastic value for money creature. Now, right. obviously, you know, it's uh, gone the other way where everybody's value for money and, you know, right. you don't find somebody who makes, uh, takes a sensible center ground. But yeah, yeah we, let's talk about that some other time. Deputy PM, you know, and I have an idea of like, you know, the greatest, uh, uh, I can't use it, it's a family channel, the greatest dash moves in Indian political history and Devi Lal being made Deputy PM by, who was it? VP Singh? VP Singh. VP yeah, Singh. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that I think is uh, competing for top of the heap. All right. So we'll sign off here and, you know, we'll be back in a second with another episode. Take care, man. Take care.